Okay, let's talk a little bit about container soil mixes and the slant here is towards the home gardener, the home grower, small scale, uh, not so much large scale production systems. Uh, let's talk about growing in containers. It's something you will need to do, will want to do. There are many advantages uh, uh, to growing in containers. If you have a seedling that you transplant, it's a couple, three weeks ahead of the weeds. That alone is enough to justify transplanting. When you transplant, you can be totally precise about your spacing and how many plants per given area. When you transplant, you have a seedling with maybe two, three, four leaves something along the lines of this little uh, seedling here. This is uh, a, f a beautiful flower native to the Azores and Canary Islands called Sorinthe uh, and it's in the borage family. It has a nice nodding kind of purple blue flower. But when you plant out a, a, a seedling transplant of anything, you've got a handful of leaves, four, five, six. Should there be some munching, birds, snails, slugs, you lose one or two, you're still probably okay. So there's a bunch of reasons why you might want to transplant versus direct sowing. Direct sowing is largely in the garden here, confined to those things that are either insanely quick, like arugula, uh, uh, sow it, germinates in three to four days, crops in 21 days, or root crops, which have a long tap root, carrots, beets, daikon, radishes, etc., uh, and they don't transplant. So, uh, so you'll want to, you'll need to grow in containers and transplant. And so you'll need a mix for your containers, a soil mix. Although in truth, most production operations, even organic ones, don't use any soil in their soil mixes. Uh, and the reasons are many and varied, but basically soil is heavy and you do a lot of lugging and moving of the containers around and you want a lighter mix. Uh, and the other thing is uh, in a, I'm gonna say somewhat perverse manner, Growers, even organic growers, look at soil as a vector for soil-borne diseases. I don't. Uh, we, our aims, our practices are such that we have a, a healthy soil that has a good balance. The soil is an ecosystem, a distinct ecosystem. Uh, and it's all about balances, checks and balances. So we have enough beneficial organisms in the soil that predate on harmful pathogenic organisms. And even more than that, these are beneficial organ soil organisms that, that are opportunistic. If there's a niche, they occupy it and multiply like crazy and simply crowd out the pathogens. So I'm a big fan of soil, certainly in the ground, but even in sowing mixes or container mixes. So uh, you can have the most beautiful soil in the world. And I'll do a modest brag here and say we here at the Allen Chadwick Garden do. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't always this way. It was a wretched clay subsoil at the outset. You could not penetrate four to six inches even with a pickaxe. Through deep digging, uh, addition of copious amounts of compost and green manures, look, 54 years later, but it only took three to five years to really get a good soil that could grow. Uh, so uh, some people have called our soil dreamy, fluffy, like a chocolate cake, and it's about two, three feet deep. Uh, so uh, uh, we use soil, to cut that quick, we use soil in our mixes. Uh, here's a simple formula for the home gardener to make a soil mix for containers. It's not the best, but it's easy and it's serviceable. Uh, three parts compost, one part soil, one point, part sand. And I say sand, I don't mean beach sand, I mean river sand, you can buy it. Uh, it's a sifted sand, it's sometimes called number two builder's sand, plasterer's sand. Uh, and that's a good combination to get you a serviceable mix. It's certainly easy uh, to procure the ingredients and it, it works out well. But as I was showing you this seedling before, I'm now showing you it more in terms of its root mass here. Uh, what you want from a soil mix is what we see in evidence here, that you want a mix that helps get you good root knit. That is, the soil and the roots are bound together so that when you move or transplant these uh, seedlings, there's very little disturbance and that leads to quick take growing on and success. Uh, so the aforementioned sand, uh, soil, compost, uh, it's good. 
uh, but sometimes you don't get enough root in it. So we tend to add some other ingredients. And the ingredients uh, that I'm talking about here would be two that are very water absorptive. Uh, let me just say these ingredients need to be pre-wet. They're not in this condition here. Uh, so I have in my hand, boy, talk about light and fluffy. This has volume but no weight. Now that's not possible according to physics, but it seems like that. Um, this is peat moss, P-E-A-T, new word, M-O-S-S. -S. It's, it's a bog plant, usually from northern latitudes. Uh, and it's reeds and sedges and such that fall into a low depression and are covered by water, a little pond, and rot very slowly over time under anaerobic conditions. Uh, and thus the nutrients are preserved in them. And it's good, they carry, peat moss carries, peat products carry nutrients, but they're more used because of their spongy nature. They can hold 20, 30, 40 times their weight in water. And they really help to assist with this binding of the roots together with the soil and it gives you good transplant. Now, peat, peat moss is, uh, not to be used dry. If you put it in a mix dry, it just messes things up. You'll have wet pockets, dry pockets like that. So you need to gently pre-wet it, not saturate it, or it turns into a slimy mess. We'll show that at a later juncture. But peat, peat moss. Uh, now that's good. But we, as an agricultural, horticultural society, are overmining the peat bogs of the world. Um, and it is a very complex, the peat bog is a very complex ecosystem, but it's not like the redwoods, a beautiful climax uh, ecosystem that gets people's attention. It's about this tall. It's really small, and a lot of it is at the ground and below the ground. Uh, and so the manner in which we uh, harvest it is you come with huge machines that take a huge six foot deep slice and just excavate the whole soil. So you are essentially destroying a really precious, sensitive ecosystem to process mine and get a product for agriculture and horticulture. Now, on a small scale, that can work out. It's being done at such a rate that we're exhausting the peat bogs of the world. Uh, and now the, the peat bog extractors are saying, oh, but we re reestablish that land. They do reestablish the land, but as cheap grazing land, not as a peat bog. Uh, this is a natural resource. It takes decades and hundreds of years to accumulate. And again, we're extracting it at a rate faster than it can regenerate. So in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a move away from, particularly in the organics world, away from peat moss itself to peat products. And the thing that uh, is now in evidence is a thing called cocoa peat or cor, C-O-I-R. And what it is is the byproduct of the coconut biz when they take the husk and they shred it to get at the meat. And then they grind it further and they create a very good peat substitute. Now it's a little more sustainable in that year. It's a byproduct not taking the base resource of a sensitive ecosystem like the peat bogs. And yet it involves a lot of processing and it comes from places like the Philippines and Sri Lanka. So there's a lot of bagging and ship. It's got a lot of mileage on it as it were, carbon miles like that. Uh, and it doesn't quite behave as good as peat moss, but it's good enough. So we use a combination of peat moss sometimes and cocoa peat at other times. I will also say that uh, cultures, particularly northern cultures where peat bogs are, uh, have known for hundreds of years that a little bit of a peat moss in a container mix, a propagation mix, seems to ward off pathogenic soil diseases. And people have known this as kind of a cultural wisdom for hundreds of years. Uh, sometime in the 90s, someone I once knew, I actually still do know, uh, uh, was doing research at Davis. They was, well, what's the deal here? And that they, they found that there were uh, uh, a range of bacteria, Pseudomona bacteria species, in peat moss that were predatory on soil pathogens. So there's science now to back up the empirical knowledge that 
different communities in farming knew for hundreds of years. So, um, so peat moss, it's light, and again, you're looking, favoring light products in a mix for their portability, and it's water absorptive. It also has a good range of nutrients, and it helps to bind that uh, root mass together. Another similar product, and I see similar in that it's completely different, but similar in the sense that it's this water retentive is what I have in my hand here, which is called vermiculite. And you see the sheeny shiny nature of it. That is mica rock. And in fact, this is a type of rock, a vermiculitic rock, rock that it features a lot of uh, mica in it. Um, one, some of the richest soils in the world derive from vermiculitic rock. If you have a ver vermiculitic based soil, you're good. The rest of us can just look on and envy. It's, it, the, it's some of the richest soils in the world, vermiculitic soils. Um, so uh, the nature of the rock is that it is porous and can also, when wet, hold a lot of water. So peat, peat products and vermiculite are good at holding water and binding the soil roots together, uh, soil and roots together. Uh, and vermiculite also carries a lot of nutrients. Um, and again, similarly, it needs to be gently wet before using it. Uh, another product that comes into play, this is not puff rice breakfast cereal. Uh, don't eat it, don't, don't try this at home. Uh, this is a volcanic rock that is mined, heated, and in a bag processed, uh, sent around the world. And it is relatively inert, and it gives you pore space or air space in your mix, and it's light, light, light. So the mix that we're using right now, which is a kind of a blend of you know, simple for the home gardener and more complex uh, for the production farmer, is three parts sifted compost, one part sifted soil, and one half part uh, peat moss, one half part vermiculite, and one half part uh, perlite. And you put all these things together, you mix them thoroughly, homogenize them, and you come up with something <clears throat> not unlike this. It is dark in color, dark indicates high organic matter and a high nutrient content. It is light and fluffy, uh, it's water absorptive, and yet it has good pore space so it drains well. Um, in short, it grows good seedlings. I have in a wheelbarrow in front of me uh, vermiculite, a mined uh, rock uh, from mica rock, a very rich rock. Uh, its attributes are, yeah, it carries a lot of nutrients, that's good for your soil mix, your plants in your soil mix, but also it is incredibly water retentive, absorptive, holding 20 to 40 times its weight in, in water. But you can't put it in the mix dry. It does not behave well. Uh, and so what I'm going to show you here applies to vermiculite. It also applies to peat moss or cocoa peat, uh, another set of ingredients that are often used in soil mixes. But I guess it could apply to if you had some dry soil a little bit, you wanted to wet it up before you put it in a soil mix, the wetting of substances. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do this in a several steps here. I'm just going to take this uh, nice uh, perforated nozzle here and I'm going to wet the surface and it will at some point start to accumulate and then you've reached saturation on the surface here. This is a slow and somewhat cumbersome tedious process. Uh, I'll wet it and then I'll start to mix it. So in the end I want this whole mass to be uniformly moist but not sodden. Having said it needs to be moistened, let me just caution you against over wetting it turns into a soggy, gooey goppy mess that will uh, impair uh, plant root growth in a soil mix. Whereas if it's wet gently, turned incrementally until I get the whole volume uniform. Uh, it'll add a little bit of pore space. It'll add 
a whole lot of watering, water uh, retention capacity, and it'll add nutrients uh, big time. Again, the richest soils in the world are formed out of vermiculitic rock. And pretty much with soil, what you've got will determine what you're gonna get. Okay, a little colloquialism there. That is, what rocks was your soil formed out of? What is their nutrient content? Some rocks are richer than others in terms of nutrients. Uh, I give you vermiculite, I give you mica, I give you basalt, very nutrient rich rocks. On the other end of the spectrum, I give you sandstone, mudstone, and quartz. Well, what do you think would be the nutrient carrying capacity of something called sandstone? Not much. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty multi-versatile product here. I'm wetting, I'm wetting, I'm turning, I'm turning, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm making sure I'm just right on that edge. Wet enough, but not sodden. Uniformly wet, no dry pockets. Um, and uh, after I uh, wash off my hand, I'm satisfied. Let's take a look at it. Again, it is uniformly moist so it's kept its structure. You can see the intermediate and large kind of particle nature of it. I do not want to over wet it and smush it and compact it. It turns into a slimy mess but actually in doing that look how water retentive is this? Look you can see I'm squeezing water out. I don't want to do that but my point here is that this is a, an incredibly water retentive uh, ingredient. A little bit gives you quite a bit of positive effect in the mix. So again, you use peat moss or cocoa peat, you use vermiculite, you need to pre-wet it gently.